Great. Well, I want to uh, thank everyone for being here today, and especially my my co panelists. Uh, as some of you know, because you have to, you've been hearing me for the last hour, I'm Professor Lisa Yazik. I'm a Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. And I am the Faculty Director for the Sci-Fi Lab at Georgia Tech. And I'm so thrilled that Jason asked us to be here today for a number of reasons. First of all, again, as many of you know, Jason was actually a graduate of my very first Sci-Fi Lab back in the early 2000s. So it feels so appropriate to be able to come here and talk with him and with all of you about what we continue to do in the lab today. Uh, the other thing I'm really excited about is that this year we're going to be talking about archives because we're actually all working on archive projects here. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the Sci-Fi Lab at Georgia Tech was set up to do two things, to give students a pace, space to either do independent research in science fiction studies or independent creation of science fiction artifacts. And not only do I have people who are doing both of these things in the lab with me this year, but everyone is working on archives. So this really couldn't have been more exciting for us. Um, I want to just take a moment to tell you a little tiny bit about what the research team is doing, and then we're going to jump in and I'm going to let the, the let all of my, um, my my research fellows tell you about more specifically what what they're doing here. So I just want to give a few minutes a uh, quick overview of what we're doing uh, in the research side just just to give you context for what the researchers will be talking about Val you're ready to talk about your play right. Cool. Um, okay. So on the research side, um, as some of you may know, if you attended the, the, the uh, City Tech uh, conference last year, I brought in a team, including Adelis. You may all remember Adelis from last year, right? And we were just finishing up our archival research for um, my book that just came out, The Future is Female Too, uh, Feminist Science Fiction Stories of the 1970s. So we talked a lot about looking at the feminist archives. Uh, that project is done, and today what, what my research team will be talking about is a brand new project that we have just barely started on. So actually, we're hoping not only to present our own findings, but to pick all of your brains. If any of you have any ideas on the things we're looking at, please let us know. So really quickly, just to tell you about it, uh, the project was originally called Octavia's Ancestors, although I really think now it should be called Ch Charles and Octavia's Ancestors. Um, but our, the question we wanted to look at was actually the question that Jessica brought up in the very first panel about what was going on, where were all the black writers uh, at the, in the early years of science fiction in the opening decades of the 20th century. We know that there was a rousing discussion, I think in Wonder Stories, for about five issues about where all the black fans were. And apparently someone said, oh, there's one black Negro fan in Atlanta because it was the 1920s. And everyone got kind of excited and I think they felt like they had done their due diligence and then the conversation died. But as Jessica pointed out, and as we know, of course, black people have always written science fiction. This goes all the way back right to Phyllis Wheatley, uh, who wrote basically the first stories about star children and motherships in her poetry in the 1700s. But what we've decided to do is to start looking at those black um, newspapers. We're not looking at the pulps right now. We're looking at the black newspaper archive because Georgia Tech just got a full access subscription. And we thought, what a wonderful place to start. So our driving question was, where, where, where were Octavia Butler's ancestors and Chip Delaney's and Charles Saunders? And so today, um, my students are going to tell you about their early speculations about where those authors were. Um, finally, then, like I said, we also do creative stuff in the lab. And historically, we've allowed students have worked on all kinds of things. We've done radio plays, we've done theater productions, um, and we have done what else have we done? I can't remember now, a lot of different things. But increasingly, it's really great that I love that students are interested in doing radio and podcast plays. And so um, Val is our most recent student in the working on this stuff. And she's gonna be talking to you a little bit about her project today and where she is in this project. Usually students take these projects all the way from uh, conception to execution and then producing the final podcast. And Val is also in the fairly early stages of her project. Okay. So I have talked enough. I don't want to talk anymore except to ask questions. So here we go. Um, so first of all, I want to ask you all if you'd be willing to introduce yourselves, tell everyone a little bit about you and how you got involved in science fiction research with me in the lab. Anyone can start. <laughs> so my name is Adelis. I am a fourth year biomedical engineering student with a minor in science fiction studies. And the way I got that minor is that I was in the beginning of doing my uh, computer science minor. And I took Lisa's science fiction class as a like extracurricular for my like BME minor. And then she told me about the lab and 
uh, she introduced me to the minor and I was like, mm, this is where it's at. So I dropped my CS minor and I started the science fiction minor. And it was honestly probably the best decision I ever made. It's really nice to like, from being in like such an engineer heavy degree to like have science fiction as a reprieve. And this semester is my last semester and I had finished the minor. So I didn't have an excuse to take another science fiction class. So I messaged Lisa and I was like, hey, is there anything you can like put me on? And so that's why I'm on this project. Oh, good. Next. Hi, Hi, my name is Lawrence Copeland, and I'm a biomedical engineer major and a physics minor in Georgia Tech. And how I got started with the lab was actually Adelis. She's one of my TAs, and she introduced me to the lab. And I find it's a great way to relax and find more interesting things. And I'm more on my humanity side from more of my STEM side of the courses. I love that the lab is a relaxing experience for you. That's such a fantastic thing. Come to the lab, relax your brain for a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm Killian Vetter. I'm a uh, computer science and math double major and have a minor in science fiction studies and very similar route as Adelis. And I took uh, Lisa's um, women in speculative fiction class and was like this is really cool <laughs> like i love learning about this stuff and i love reading this stuff so i came to the science fiction lab to get more of that val you're up <laughs> all right oh so i um actually switched majors over from biology after spring of last year um, and a friend of mine actually connected me to Lisa over email and was just like, hey, you know, I know you're interested in science fiction. You came from science. This might work. Um, and so I reached out and I took her um, history of science fiction course over the summer. And I mostly did that to like see if we would kind of like, you know, click because I mentioned working in her lab and that was kind of what we wanted to do. And I think after like the first two classes, it was just like a done deal. Um, and so I'm an LMC major, but a lot of my classes have been in science fiction. And so while I don't have a sci-fi minor, it is kind of like the main thing I study within my major. For those of you who aren't at tech, we're acronym heavy and LMC is literature, media and communication, which is mine and Val's home department. And uh, sometimes home, right? Temporary landing pad for Lawrence and Killian and Adela's. Cool. All right, great. So now we get to the exciting stuff here. Well, I'd love to have you all talk about where you are with your research and creation right now. Val, I don't know if you were in the last panel or not, but I promised them that you were gonna be talking about archives and climate change. So they're very excited. I hope I didn't uh, set you up there. Um, and then obviously the three of you who are doing the research, Octavia's Ancestors Project, if you can talk a little about your stuff and maybe we should start with Val just to turn things around this time. Sure, so. <laughs> Um, what would you like me specifically to talk about? Just an overview. Tell or... us about your project. Uh, give us an okay. overview of the play and how you're thinking about archives and maybe um, the way climate change is playing into the timeline of your story. Because I yeah, think it's kind absolutely. of a natural fit, right? Oh, 100%. So um, my play, the working title is Interference, and I think I'm going to stick with it, um, is a play about, so I wanted to tie together kind of like cyberpunk and solarpunk. So there is an archivist who finds a journal um, detailing basically what would have been the end of the world and the people that stopped it. And all other records of this have been erased because they were digital, but she finds this one physical thing and it's enough to kind of connect her back to the character that I just call the author who wrote the journal, author of the journal, all that kind of stuff. And the author's world in the past is so riddled with climate change and everything else and of course it's a cyberpunk setting so that's not shocking anyone that this kind of apocalyptic event is something that just really naturally progresses um i don't want to give away too much obviously but it just kind of naturally flows with how the setting is but a hundred years in the future, humanity is rebuilt. You know, it's a society that relies on green energy and everything else. And so it's definitely a shock not having other records of this thing to stumble across something that was so abrupt. But at the same point in time, having this physical proof that it happened and having this, you know, 
it's a woman character, woman from the past, giving her own experiences is a really important way to connect together generations, even across a gap of, you know, hundreds of years. Cool. Thank you. All right, researchers, tell us what you've found so far about Octavia's ancestors. Do they exist? And if so, where are, were they and what were they writing? Any of you can start. <laughs> if we're going backwards, I may as well. Uh, okay. Sorry. So um, what I've found is not as much science fiction as you'll hear from uh, Eloise and Lawrence later, but it's still, I find, pretty interesting. Uh, so I was focusing more on just finding any fiction and turns out there is a lot of romance uh, stories that were published in the, um, in the the Atlanta Daily World is what I mostly focused my search in. And uh, there were also a number of adventure stories too, but romances seem to be the um, most popular genre. And uh, the one that I uh, was looking at in particular was a serial called Prince of the Pampas, uh, created by or written by Lois Ebby and John C. Fleming. And it it follows a like a Vermont newspaper woman as she goes down to Argentina and is like whisked away by a playboy. And it's kind of uh, interesting to see that that was what was. Well, it seemed popular at the time, considering it got like 30 plus chapters published yeah. throughout its run. And uh, Lois Ebby and John C. Fleming seemed to be very widely published uh, in newspapers and uh, with uh, their romance stories. So that was a kind of interesting thing that I thought I turned in. So I, I love that, especially I, I was so excited you did the Atlanta papers. And I think the fact that there are so many romances when we were looking for like science fiction and adventure was it was really interesting and speaks right to the desire of people to control their own narratives of romance and sexuality, um, even even, you know, in the early papers. And that's that's great. Thank you. Did you ever find out Do we know anything about the race of either of those authors? Because I know that's um, another thing is we're trying to figure out because we know that both black and white authors were published in the in the black newspapers. So I wasn't able to find it, but Lois Ebby's uh, the two of them seem to be in a lot of newspapers, both white and black. And I think um, in my research, I turned out that Lois Ebby wrote some screenplays for Hollywood, or at least was oh, somewhat involved in writing for Hollywood. So that kind of implies probably white, but yeah. we don't know yet for sure. But yeah, that's interesting, right? I know that I was speaking with, we're gonna be working with um, Dr. Isaiah Lavender at UGA and his research team next semester. And they did a, they were inspired by us and did a quick scan based on what you had found, Killian. And they found that like Louis L'Amour was often published in black newspapers as well. And so thinking about like why it is that like the leading white writer of Westerns would have been so popular in black newspapers was interesting as well. So. Um, so much more for us to do at the very beginning of this project, right? All right, Lawrence or Dallas? I can go next. So at the beginning of the archival research, I was trying to use certain keywords to see if I could find any stories. And the keywords I use is Mars. And that brought me to this author named John P. Moore, who I'm unsure if it's uh, his actual name or maybe it's a pen name because the name seems very basic, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he wrote in many newspapers, such as the Pittsburgh Courier and the New Journal and Guide. But his major series that I'm going to talk about of writings was actually in the Afro-American, which is out of Baltimore. And in this paper, he wrote a series of short stories called The Amazing Stories, which the purpose, as it states, is to project the readers several years into the future when science will have achieved the impossible and life will have been completely controlled by limitless possibilities, which is basically science fiction. And my favorite short story out of these series is a story called Love on Mars, which has great world building and is built on Mars where great two great nations, the Pragians and the Elsians are at war. And of course, this war brings a mixed race person who our captain, who's a Pragian, is trying to fall in love with. But an Elsian is also trying to fall in love with. So it brings some conflict. 
Oh, so we got both. I didn't. I, you hadn't told us about the romance <laughs> aspect before. I get literal. So love on Mars really is about yeah. love on Mars and interracial love, which was such a popular uh, trope in fiction at that time. I'm thinking about like um, Pauline Hopkins of One Blood and um, I think Nella Larson's passing. And yeah, this is really, that's so cool. That's great. And he was publishing primarily in the black newspapers, right? So I think we're, we're assuming that here we've got a black author find, um, but yeah, the, the genericness of the name has yielded nothing so far for us, right? In terms of biographical research. We'll keep reading his stories. Maybe we'll find more. If any of you know who John P. Moore is, please let us know. <laughs> Adela? I shall go next. So I found a short story titled A Moon Dream by Lillian E. Patterson. And this story, just to give some background, was published September 8th and 1923 in the Chicago Defender. But when I like, because when you use this software, it like takes you directly to the story. So to get more context, I went to like, where it was published in the newspaper and it was published in the junior defender or the defender junior which was the children's section and those featured in this section were part of the bud billiken club which is a social club that was for african-american youth trying to encourage them to uh aim to be respectable and to be proud of their race and this club is actually still around they host the bud billiken day parade which is the largest african-american play parade in the u.s so i thought that was really cool that and this is like the year that it was like made, this story was published. So I thought it was really cool to see like the inception of something that like is still going on like 90 years forward. And so um, when I looked at the section of the newspaper at the bottom, there's a little piece you can clip out and you can write in your name where you're from. So even people like outside of the state could like join the Bud Billiken Club. So that kind of made it hard to find this author because we, I first assumed they were just going to be in Chicago area and keep their same name. But when I realized that they were 18 or younger and maybe outside the state, like tracking that person down, maybe if they continued writing but got married or moved, that's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. But anyways, about the story, I love the story because it kind of reads as like an alien abduction. So it's from the perspective of a little girl who's like trying to fall asleep and she notices a little man at the foot of her bed. And he's like, hey, do you want to come meet the moon man with me? And they um, leave her house via, um, quote, a bridge of broad light, which fell quivering from the moon onto the earth, unquote, which like immediately gave me the image of like cows being beamed up by like a UFO. And so when we get to the moon, we meet the moon man who is the king of the moon. And he's described as having a large round bald head, a tiny body and funny thin little legs which like immediately was like the Greys stereotype. And this story like predates the beginning of that stereotype in American culture by like 60, 40 years, which was like super fun. And it was totally not what I was expecting, especially from like a kid's section of a newspaper. So I'm pretty happy with that because I thought I was going to come out of this hands empty. Yeah. And this was just all on our first round of research too, right? Where we just, um, we... I, th I think that Matt Frizzell, who some of you met in the last panel, and I had hoped we were going to do a slow run up to get everyone trained and like well versed in like the history of African American pulp fiction and in archival research stuff. And I think after two meetings, you guys were like, let us loose into the archives. And, and we did. And it was amazing the things that got found just right away. Um, really quickly, I just want to say, Lawrence, what was the date of the Love on Mars stories or the, the, the amazing stories that John Moore wrote? the it was from oh, it was from december of 1930 to around february of 1931 so not that much of a time period it was no, only but around six newspaper entries interesting but that's right at the point of like right like where gernsback's amazing stories is really starting to peak in popularity as well which is interesting that you have that play on amazing and amazing and I don't know if it was on purpose, like to sort of invoke, right, this white tradition of science fiction storytelling, um, and then shift the landscape over to talking about race and science fiction, or if it just happened to be a coincidence. Um, and one thing, Adelis, I was thinking, do you know, there's a car, there was a comic strip called Little Nemo in Slumberland, which was about a little boy who had adventures in his sleep. And I, and, and, and I think it was from around that same time period or even earlier. And I wonder how much Patterson is in dialogue with that, because it was wildly popular. And yeah, I imagine, had, yeah, yeah, if you're a kid and you like see this like set of like comic strips that you really like and you like just join this newspaper 
and you're part of this club, like maybe you're like, okay, that's my in. Like if I write yeah, something. Yeah, that like could that. be what inspired you, right? Because that happens often for kids. You're inspired by the things you read to start mm-hmm. writing in that kind of universe. You know, that's a possibility. Cool. We'll have to sort of poke at that next semester, although you won't be with us. All right. Cool. Um, all right. So shall we move on to our next discussion question? So I wanted to ask everyone a little bit about the, the perils and promises of archival research and uh, archival cr- and creating and representing archives. So let me ask each of you for the kinds of projects that you're working on, whether it's creative or research projects, what's been sort of the biggest or most surprising challenge for you so far in terms of grappling with either using archives or representing them? The biggest grapple I faced with finding the archives when it comes to more actually is more wrote his stories in kind of parts. So it would be part one, part two. And Love on Mars is a two part, so part one and part two. However, he wrote two other stories, such one is called The Hidden Kingdoms. However, we only have part one. And I'm wondering, I've been looking through the series and he doesn't really write from each newspaper, so sometimes he skips a week. So it's mm. kind of hard to discover. And we know that he wrote in many different newspapers. So I'm yes. wondering, has is part two in another newspaper or like where does yeah. part two have gone? Right, or did it even get published? I think that that's another thing we might worry about, right? Because we know that Martin Delaney's Blake or the Huts of America, an 1860s um, future uh, black future war story also got never, never got finished because of the Civil War. So yeah, who, we'll have to, it is hard to find these things, surprisingly so. Anyone else? Yeah, on a very similar route, uh, you know, this certainly isn't the most surprising thing about diff- about difficulties I've been having. But uh, the biggest is it's hard finding anything. Like there's so much stuff getting published in newspapers, you know, they've got news, they've got stories, like just finding, um, uh, any science fiction is, uh, it's rough because you're searching through stuff and you find, you know, a story about like a scientific breakthrough or, you know, and it's like, oh, well, that's interesting, but right. that's not what I'm looking for. Yeah. So it's certainly rough uh, actually finding what I uh, want to get. <laughs> right. And especially since we're looking so early in the 20th century, that that phrase science fiction hasn't solidified in culture yet. So you can't like look for the science fiction story. We've had to, yeah, really work with a series of um, interesting keywords. And it's been a real process, uh, finding which ones stick and which ones don't. Yeah. Yeah, to speak to that, um, it's also easy to get like distracted because of the bulk of the stuff, like mm-hmm. super mundane things like cake recipes and like gossip columns. I'm like, oh, I wanna know what the tea is. Like, let me save yeah. this and maybe try to make this cake like, 90 years after it was like published about so that's really fun and like the scientific discoveries did get in the way a lot because you think like oh surely like power and like ray combined with those things, like that'll get me to science fiction but then you end up on like news articles about everybody talking about the scientist who's like from britain who's developed this like huge array of like lights to beam at an opposing enemy on the battlefield and they're like oh who's he gonna sell it to and like that's what they're talking about and you're like oh like killian said this is super fascinating but not where i need to be yeah it's funny you guys keep saying that but i'm sort of interested in the flow right of of how they like the flow between the newspaper articles to the advertisements to the stories themselves they do seem to sort of tell a story and right didn't you find like a children's science column as well at one yeah. point yeah uh i found in using the word ray like i put ray and adam and mm-hmm. i found uncle ray's corner which was in <laughs> i think in illinois uh newspapers and basically it was like a little section of newspaper that like told kids about cool things about science like anywhere from like bees to like the amazon rainforest and like their whole initiative was to try to keep kids interested and a lot of things geared towards kids was like trying to which i guess is what we're still trying to do like keep them in school keep them interested in the topics that are covered in school and try to keep them i guess safe and off the streets, and especially since these are in like African-American newspapers, a lot of the rhetoric is around like being respectable and like 
achieving the middle class standards. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was also really interesting because yeah. I feel like that's more removed because we have like either TV or like kids are hand or parents are handling that. And yeah. I guess you don't really get to see it as a person my age. Like I'm not, I don't know about the sphere of like kid politics right now. Like what are, what's happening to the children? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I, I think people always want their kids to be respectable, but that language of respectability and gaining the middle class is always important for right cultural minorities and disempowered people who don't have power. And under capitalism, I think Joanna Russ once said that like the greatest power you can have is to become part of the middle class. So I think that that's interesting, right? That this moment when we're seeing the rise of the modern civil rights movement, you're seeing that uh, interest in science and technology, but also respectability all sort of coming together. Cool. Yeah. And I think that even from this first round of research we've done, I would just note that from the things that Lawrence and Killian and Adels have found, I mean, what we're finding is a whole world of science and technology and storytelling was really contained within the Black newspapers. And I remember back in, um, gosh, in 2000, in Sherry Thomas's uh, Dark Matters series, Chip, Chip Delaney talks about uh, where were the Black authors in the pulp era. And his theory was that they all booked away from the science fiction magazines and back to the Black magazines because uh, the, the science fiction magazines looked so silly and disrespectable or disreputable. And what you're finding is maybe more positively that the Black newspapers contained everything that the science fiction magazines had. They had the science columns, they had the stories, they had letters. So you didn't need to go anywhere else at some level. So far, this is stage one of the research. Who knows where we'll be in six months with it, right? Val, how about for you? What's it been like the biggest challenge representing archives in your work? Oh, gosh. Um, I think the biggest thing is building so much of the like past world and all of the conflict there because again it's this massive event it's been really hard trying to do justice to how interesting archival work is um because like i find it fascinating i love hearing about you guys's research and i've had to do some of my own because you know i was a biology major like i'm used to digging through stuff um but it is incredibly hard to like put that into a radio drama um, especially with kind of a frame story, because you want to balance both parts of the frame and keep it, you know, engaging for the listener and, and still uphold the fact that it's an important narrative. Um, and so I just think kind of doing that justice has been kind of difficult to balance. I think I'm getting there, but yeah, it's been a little tricky. It occurs to me as you're talking, like, is the problem that Part of it is I know that with the structure of your play, you want to withhold certain amounts of information for much of the narrative, right? In part to gesture to the incompleteness of the archive and the gap in time. Um, but then of course the job of archivists is to preserve and show information, right? So how do you represent the failure of that or something or the partiality of that? It feels like there's almost a tension in your work between what archivists do, but what your narrative wants to do or needs to do. Yeah, I would I would say so. Um, I think the biggest way to balance that is to represent this kind of searching. So like when we have lost information, what do we do? We go to our local library system, we dig through things. Um, mm -hmm. And especially because this is relying on a physical copy of things. And mm -hmm. um, part of the thing that I kind of caution against is, is leaning on digital records too much because mm -hmm. they can just get wiped out. You don't have them ever again. Um, and so while, while I do love the trees dearly, please save the trees. Um, right. At the same point in time, kind of that tension between, you know, not really what medium is best, but what medium kind of, you know, stands the test of time, especially yeah. in this narrative. And can, be, and can be accessed by people in different eras with mm -hmm. different technologies, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is, uh, yeah, that's actually a really important question, isn't it? Jeez, cool, all right. So let's move on then, um, and then one last question, and then if anyone in the audience wants to throw out comments or questions or suggestions, we'd love to talk with you. But I'd love to wrap up by finding from each of you, or tell me like really quickly, what's been the most rewarding part of this research for you? Like what's been your best find or your happiest moment? For I say, me, uh, yeah. Lawrence, uh, yeah, as I say, have Lawrence or Killian go first. You haven't had a chance. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so one of the, 
maybe not most rewarding, but I think the coolest moment was cool when I first that. discovered uh, Lois Abbey and we were talking about her and doing them, people were searching and somebody was looking at one of her books on Amazon and one of the reviews was like, oh, this is my aunt. Like, it's like, <laughs> what? How does that happen? Like, yeah. you know, just searching through all these different websites and sometimes you uncover something that's uh, an interesting find and who knew it would be Amazon? Yeah, right, I know. Amazon, never forget Amazon is an important possible archival resource, I guess. <laughs> I love that, yeah. It was a nice moment because it made that history come to life for us. It was like, oh my God, this person had a family like, and they interact with modern people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that, that was neat. So one of my coolest things that I found or like to do is kind of think of it as like a little guilty pleasure is to go through some of these old newspapers and yeah. kind of search through like there's always a section where there's always selling things and it's cool to look at things that they were selling back then you like from a perspective now it's obviously like a scam or like not good for you. And it's just been cool just to read them, how they're trying to sell you on this thing that obviously it's not going to work or it's like, like what? they're trying to take your money. Like what? Well, this, one of the things which is kind of like, um, since many of their African-American newspapers, like they would sell like bleach tablets to lighten your skin, which is very yes. like. It's, dangerous. Yeah, yeah dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but they always try to sell it to you in this nice way. And I just found it it's just interesting that they're trying to push it so heavily. I think that's amazing. And for what it's worth, the science fiction magazines did the same thing. Not the bleach tablets, but I saw, I remember I've seen ones for like nose straighteners and all kinds of like weird, like uh, oh, Listerine, Listerine, make sure your breath doesn't stink. That probably though transcended races, my guess. I bet you those Listerine ads were everywhere. But um, yeah, it is weird that there was this, maybe advertising is still like that. I think it is. I think we still are sold things that are silly and that we don't need, but it seems so obvious in the newspapers. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know you were finding them there. Another reason black people didn't need to read the science fiction papers. You literally got the same ridiculous ads, maybe more targeted, but yeah, that's so cool. Val or Adelis? For me, uh, when I first like started looking for stories, I happened a lot of romance stories, and a lot of them had like the author's portrait, which I absolutely loved. I loved having like a face to tie the, to the story. And the bulk of the stories in these African American uh, newspapers were like interracial like romances. And often um, they were critical of like the injustice and like the status quo and how most of these had to be like forbidden or kept hidden. Mm. And one of the super interesting ones I found is in a um, black newspaper, it was a white woman. And in addition to her story, she also talked like there's like a little excerpt at the end of it about how like she was basing it off of her like relationship. And I was like, that is so fascinating because this is like interracial marriage is like legal in 1967 I think and it's like 30 years before that and I feel like it's really brave to like come out and like tie your portrait and your face and your name to like a story about how like some like a love that you feel like should be right and should be allowed and should be discussed I I loved that that's a great ally moment and and also yeah about the need to put your body on the line to change things that's that's cool All right, Val, you get to you get to top that one. <laughs> All right, oh, I don't know. That's going to be difficult. Um, I mean, definitely from a, a creative perspective, I think the biggest thing was just like having an opportunity to work on something like this um, and also having a system to hold me accountable to it because I do a lot of writing in like online fiction collectives. Um, but this is definitely the first time I've kind of tackled something of this skill and had to like work from the ground up and really, really build through it and think about how I want to do everything. Um, and I think just being able to actually like take on that challenge and have a, a supportive space, obviously with the sci-fi lab to like experiment and kind of get through that process has been just like the biggest blessing for me. I know when 
um, I talked to Lisa about it for the first time. I like immediately texted all my friends and it was like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, and it's just been really nice to have that opportunity. I've appreciated it a lot and it's it's been fun. Well, that's great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and that gets us through our planned discussion questions. Uh, so we would love to open it up if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments for us. There's a cool question I see about a research blog. About what? About if we have a research blog for people to keep up to date with. Which... Really? I am not, I, okay, I'm not seeing all the, I'm not getting the whole webinar chat for some reason. So please, by all means, I don't see any questions about a blog. Well, well because Lisa, if you can click on Q&A at the bottom of the webinar window. Oh, I see it there. Yep, I'm in the wrong place. All right, cool. Yeah. All right, good. Sorry. Yep. All right. Let me go back to moderating here then for you all. <laughs> right. So Joe asks, um, how is there? Oh, yeah. Is there a research blog or anything like that or a work in progress where people can keep up with us? There's not, but I would love to set one up because that's a great idea. It is a really good idea, especially since I'm going to be out ski. I can like stalk it and be like, oh, my God, <laughs> oh, I'll yeah. be, like texting you guys and be like, what's happening? I think that that's a great idea. And Killian, maybe we should talk about having you take that on as part of your work if you want to in, in the in the spring. So I love the idea of, of setting up a blog. Um, and maybe we can ask our librarians, Matthew and Allison, to help us with that, maybe connect it to the sci-fi collection at Tech as well. I think that would be cool. Thank you, Joe. What a great idea. Ah, more unpaid labor, though. <laughs> Actually, we can get, this is the thing is, many of my students are paid. They're getting either credit hours or funding. Uh, this year, Lawrence and Killian are funded by the Center for Women, Science and Technology at Georgia Tech. And so hopefully we'll be able to get some, some more money to, to do that. I love this idea. All right, any other questions or comments? I think we've stunned you all, it sounds like, into silence. Um, we did have a few things in the chat. Um, where someone had mentioned that the descriptions of the large-headed aliens seem a bit reminiscent of some of Olaf Stapledon's con comments in Star Maker. Um, Adelis, I don't know if you've read that. That was a pulp era book from, yeah, it's the 20s or 30s. So that's interesting. So Stapledon was a British uh, author, philosopher, and science fiction writer. So that so what we're hearing then is there were indeed sort of these uh, kinds of representations, maybe a little bit happening at this time. So thank you, Jacob Adler. That's really useful to know. All right. Oh, and then someone said that that Windsor, the Little Nemo comic was uh, actually is now a Netflix show starring The Rock with a gender flipped Nemo. That's cool. I've seen the ads for that. I didn't realize it was based on the Windsor K thing. All right. We're getting a lot of love. Thank you all. This is really lovely. Um, ooh, Jillian Pollock says there's a German university that keeps its blog up by having students do the blog posts and essays there, all science fiction and all interesting. What a wonderful idea. Jillian, do you know where it is? What university? Or could you point me to a URL? Maybe not now, but if you could at some time, that would be really great. And that would be a lovely way to um, share with you all. Oh, Dusseldorf. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll check that out. Great. We can use that as a model, maybe. Killian, take note especially because you volunteered. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, is, I don't know if this is actually Kenrick or Ida who's using this account, but um, either Kenrick or Ida Yoshida, or no, I'm sorry, Kenrick Yoshida. So uh, my apologies, I, I was reading that wrong. It is Ida using it. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. So Professor Yoshinaga, uh, Izella, you've taken classes with her, right? Right. So, um, and the rest of you will encounter her eventually, right? So she asked if we've looked at the techno-scientific discourse of African-Americans at that era. Um, obviously, there's a lot of folk lore around George Washington Carver and his inventions, for instance. Did any of you come across anything like that? Well, actually, I guess, Adelis, you did a little bit because you found the children's science column, right? And weren't you the one who was found the articles about like Klieg lights and who was going to use these lights and things like that? Uh, what lights? Or I think there's some kind of lights that people were going to use on the battlefield you were talking oh, about. Oh, yes, some invention. yes, these like big arrays that were to like stun the opposing, right. um, what's it called, group of people trying to attack you? Yeah, the enemy. <laughs> opposing army. <laughs> the opposing army, yes. yes. <laughs> um, okay, cool. 
Yeah. So, but we, but so far we haven't seen anything like any references to like George Washington Carver or Benjamin Banneker. I've done a lot of work on Benjamin Banneker, the grant, you know, a pioneering uh, free black scientist from colonial times. And his name was also shows up a lot in science fiction stories or at least homages to him. But I don't know. Did you guys find like, like celebrations of black genius? We weren't really looking there yet, but I think that maybe that's a good place to look next. Just as you were looking around, did you find anything like that? Celebrations of black genius, either in fiction or in the, the literature? All right, cool. Well, then we'll have to take a look around. <laughs> right, um, oh yeah, uh, Joe Walton thinks you should start baking those cakes and making the recipes you all are finding and that that could be sort mm -hmm. of instantiated historical research. I love that idea, Joe. It's true, food is history, right? And the way people made food was so different then. It's actually really interesting. I love that. All right, and then finally, we've got a, a, a comment from Jason who says, thinking of the little Nemo connection to the moon story for Adelis, um, there were racist elements and characters in the little Nemo stories based on an earlier comic by the author. I wonder if your story might adapt or change or remove some of those. That would be a great thing for us to look at in the future would be to sort of compare some of these stories to what their white analogs seem to be and see how that works. Yeah, that would be interesting. Cool. Yeah, I think that would do a lot to give us context for, as you said, how people are taking charge of their own narratives and yeah. reacting to ones that are already kind of more culturally popular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great line of research. Um, I'm so glad Jason is recording all of this so we can go back and look at it later <laughs> and have this. Joe, yes, this is indeed building towards another hopefully canon shaking anthology. This is something that um, Isaiah Lavender and I had been poking at for a while. And then, you know, I had the group of students and some resources this semester to get a start on that. And um, we actually told Isaiah a little bit about what we found so far. And he got one of his grad students going and they immediately started finding things just like we were. So we're hoping to bring the two research teams together. We're actually going to have the undergraduates training the graduates. Go Georgia Tech undergraduates next semester. And um, yeah, we are hoping um, eventually to pull these stories and, and to bring them out. We know that there is, there's been a little bit of writing on the black pulp tradition, but to date, it's been a lot like Eric Leaf Davin's early book on women in science fiction, um, kind of an overview with names and stories, but not a lot of working out necessarily the patterns of things. And I think that that's what we're hoping to do. And again, thanks to all of you for your ideas about connecting it more to the science, connecting it more to the white popular culture of the time. I think that this is the way to build a really rich introduction or anthology. And you'll all get credit in the acknowledgements too. <laughs> oh, Lee, thank you so much. Yeah, so maybe the blog, Lee, would a blog be a way for your students to find out more about it? You can of course uh, direct them to come and watch this video once it goes online. I know that Jason posts everything. And, um, but yeah, that's, if there's any other ways you can think that we can get out the kind of work we're doing and find out about other schools, if any of you have students who are doing this kind of work, let us know, we would love to connect with you. All right, people, I think that we have two minutes left. So we could either wrap up early in something that never happens in conversations about science fiction, or if anyone wants to throw out one last question and run us over, that's fine too. Panelists, if you have any questions or comments, either for each other or for the audience, also a good time. That's a weird question. We did. But... All right, let's do it then. Let's wrap up one minute early. Enjoy. Sorry, Lisa, can I, yeah. a really quick question. Um, I don't remember if uh, Val had mentioned this, but where is the radio drama going to be? Is it going to be on rec or uh, how can audience find that? What is the plan, Val? Where would you like it to go? I don't really have an idea. <laughs> um, I do know, I know rec is an option. Um, I know, I think you also had like, we've, we've hosted podcasts online before, yeah. but um, this is my time to request a page on the blog for that because that would be really convenient. That's that we can link a great idea. Things. Yeah. That mm -hmm. would be really good. So, right. Um, working on that, I guess, is the answer yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a good idea. So, we should do this. And what we might be able to do is we do have a sci fi at tech web, web page. I'm pretty sure it's sci fi.lmc.gotech.edu. Um, and that what we should probably do is build both the blog and put the radio dramas there. 
um, previous radio dramas. We actually have a Sci-Fi Lab radio drama YouTube channel, so you can post there as well. And what we might want to do is really reactivate and promote that. But I like the idea of it centralized on one page. Killian, I, I hope you're you taking notes. I think put them everywhere. Because I think the rec, uh, I'm actually wearing a rec sweatshirt <laughs> right now. But um, they, I think they started a radio play a couple months ago. I'm not on the rec enough to like hear it, but like it's definitely something that could happen. So having it like in yeah. multiple places, I think would be cool. And I think it would also like advertise yeah. a lot because so many times, every time I TA, I'm like, you should become a science fiction minor and people are like that's an option and i'm like yeah. yes <laughs> yep yeah i think that that's a great idea and i'm not going to get into like the weeds right now of rec radio but for those of you who don't know georgia tech has a famous student-run radio 100,000 watts we were one of the first all jazz stations in america and we still have a strong jazz tradition we also have a little strong science fiction tradition the two come together we have like recordings of Sun Ra from like the 60s and 70s because he would always visit tech and just chat with us. So I love the idea of bringing putting the play on there and I'm excited to know that they're running plays now. That's not something that's always happened on Rec Radio. It's it's a really cool innovative um, station and we've successfully fended off takeovers by NPR because we do such cool stuff and I'm excited to know we continue that tradition. Ha, we did it, we ran over. Now we are not gonna get done early. All right. So thank you, Jason, for making sure that you uh, helped us run over and in the mighty science fiction fashion. And thank you to all of my students for being here. You're all such amazing people. I look forward to celebrating your accomplishments with, with, uh, in person soon. Those of you who were here for the panel, thank you so much for your time and your attention, your awesome suggestions. Um, we look forward to also crossing paths with you in the future and having in, in real life drinks or desserts with you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa, Val, Lawrence, Killian, Edelies. This is really terrific work that you're all doing. Uh, and the Sci-Fi Lab is always welcome at the uh, City Tech Science Fiction Symposium. So y'all have a good rest of the day. And thanks for everyone you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to take a break for like five minutes while we get set up for uh, the Analog Writers Panel and the Analog Emerging Black Voices Award presentation. Uh, so we'll get started with that uh, shortly. But let everybody take a break, walk around, uh, get some coffee. Uh, juice back up so you're ready to rock and roll for an afternoon of science fiction discussions. <laughs>